good evening welcome to the 44th edition of the guru mantan 50 discussions with educationists and uh, thinkers the guru mantan is being organized by in the vivekananda institute of leadership uh, development our mission is to develop human and social capital to build a resurgent india we work with uh, multiple sectors uh, across the government ngos corporates and the community this particular uh, series of lectures the guru mantan is a platform for teachers to discuss share and debate and learn from our diverse uh, experiences and uh, uh, we started in uh, august 2020 and we have just entered uh, june so we have been at it for uh, about 10 months uh, now uh, Today, we have with us uh, Dr. Niraja Raghun, a renowned educationist. She is the founder director of Thinking Teacher. Uh, she has been uh, also associated with the uh, uh, JK uh, School, JK Foundation Schools, and along with Azim Premji University, among other uh, assignments. Uh, she comes from a very interesting pure science background and has moved into uh, education and she's been in this field for over two decades now. Uh, welcome uh, to this uh, lecture series, ma'am. It's a pleasure to have you here. Uh, so the, the like the standard format, uh, we'll be having 25 minutes of uh, talk followed by uh, a moderated Q&A session for about 30 minutes. So the audience uh, can uh, drop in their questions in the chat box. Between me and Ramesh, we'll pick them up uh, during the Q&A session. Over to you, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you for this opportunity. Uh, I've always admired the work of SVYM, so I'm very honored to have this opportunity. I will, without further delay, share my screen. So I think we have a lot of teachers in the audience, is what Praveen told me. So I thought I could speak on reflective writing for teachers. Why, what, and how? As you know, I run an enterprise called Thinking Teacher. And maybe there is, this is a question in some teachers' minds. Why should a teacher reflect at all? So I think we will all agree that the repetitive nature of a teacher's job, it, it's very easy for us to start falling into a set behavior pattern because we have the same syllabus. It doesn't change that often. More or less the same textbook. We just get a new bunch of students every year. And we can become very practiced and so efficient in the art that we stop thinking about it. And a teacher who stops thinking is a very dangerous teacher to have. Because a teacher who doesn't think, you can be sure the students of that teacher also don't think. And that's the last thing we want. So just a bit of reflection can turn things around. And when a teacher reflects, students may also begin to reflect. And isn't that what we want? And I think we all know what is the result of not reflecting at all. So... Um, I, I would like to share with you a little story here. Uh, when I was teaching in the Krishnamurti Foundation School years ago, I was assigned to teach science to grade six. And that was the first year that uh, the students had three books for physics, chemistry, and biology. And until then, they had learned EVS or science, whatever. So I, uh, as you know, I have done chemistry. Chemistry was my love, thanks to my teacher in school. So I didn't have any problem preparing for their chemistry lessons. In fact, I didn't prepare. I would just look at the book and say, okay, I'm going to teach this tomorrow. Physics, I had a set of very bad teachers. So I was very afraid of physics. So I worked hard to prepare for every physics class. I would have to learn the content. Biology I had not even taken in school. It was a elective. So biology I had to start from scratch. And this was a Krishnamurti Foundation school, pretty well to do. In those days, we didn't have CDs. We, we had video cassettes. So I would take home video cassettes of David Attenborough's wonderful films and I would watch them and I would make notes. And the next day I would show the film to the children and we would discuss and that's how we learned biology. At the end of the year, I asked the students, which was the most exciting? I think you can guess which of the three they found most exciting. 
biology. And I said, which was the most boring? I think again, you can guess, it was chemistry. My first love was the most boring because you see, I had stopped thinking about it. And when you stop thinking about something, you make sure your students stop thinking about it. So I would like to continue something about my own story here. And this is as a kindergartner when I was five years old. You can see my gray hair. This happened more than half a century ago, but it is a very vivid memory for me. I was a scared five-year-old who had been admitted to the kindergarten of a convent school in Delhi. And the only language I knew was Tamil. I had not even learned Hindi yet, but this was a convent school run by Irish nuns. And I still remember my kindergarten teacher. Her name was Miss Dias. And she gave us these lined, we had these lined notebooks with these squares for numbers. And she gave us something to write. And I must tell you that I was a very dutiful student. If the teacher said, jump into the well, I would have jumped into the well. I was that type of a student, right from the start. So here she gave us some work to do and I very dutifully did it. Whatever I had to do, I forget what it was. Maybe write the numbers one to 10 or one to 20. And I went and presented the book to her. She said something which I didn't understand. I think she said it in English. And she had this red pencil. She poked the first square of the paper. And she sent me back. All I could understand was I had done something wrong. I had to redo it. So I dutifully redid it on a fresh page. And I went up to her and gave it to her. Now she got... Her, her temperature rose. I could tell from the tone in her voice that she was getting irritated. She spoke in Hindi. I could tell it was Hindi, but I couldn't, didn't understand a word. It didn't make a difference. She poked the pencil hard into the paper, so hard that the paper tore. And she said whatever she had to say. I was miserable. I didn't understand a word. And I wished she'd tell me I would have obeyed every word of what she said. I just didn't understand it. This happened three or four times. By the end, I was in tears and I gave up. I didn't know what I was doing wrong. And in my utter resignation, I left that first square blank and I started from the second square. I didn't even know what I was doing. I just did it. Because maybe she had poked a hole in the first square. I don't know. When I went and presented the work to her, she said, ah, oh, there you are. You got it. I could tell from her side that I had done the right thing. To this day, I have not understood what was so sacred or sacrosanct about leaving that first square and why she had to make a five-year-old so utterly miserable about it. But I do remember the fear. I do remember that she assumed I knew the language she spoke and our huge communication gap. And I do remember how rule-bound she was. And to this day, it is utterly incomprehensible to me. What does it matter whether you start in the first square or the second square? You should get your numbers right, is what I thought and still think. But why am I telling you the story? When I became a teacher, that scared five-year-old was still inside me. She's still inside me now as I speak to you. Where did she go? She's inside me. And that rule-bound teacher who terrified me was still in my memory. She still is. So both of them, they influenced how I engaged with my students. Whether I was conscious of it or not, they influenced it. And as so much more from my past did. But was I aware of this when I first started teaching? No, I was not aware. Of it. I just plunged into the deep end and started teaching, as most teachers will find familiar. I have a question for you to think about. You don't have to answer it right away. Would it have helped if I was aware of it? If so, how would it have helped? I would like to share with you the, a research paper that puts this pretty well. It's called Telling Teaching Stories, and these are the authors. And it appears in this journal, and it talks of using personal histories in teacher education. One of the many valuable things it says is that teacher education is commonly seen as an injection, almost like a COVID shield or a co vaccine. But teacher education is not an injection. It's not a one-time shot. It's a continuum. It is lifelong. And education, it defines as more of a process of rethinking and rebuilding the past. It says that every moment in our lives, whether we are in class or not, 
Our entire person is there. Our past is there. Whether we acknowledge it or not, it is there. So, for example, when I taught chemistry to eighth graders, my the subject that I specialized in, I could not leave my past out. No one can. Carried it me always. And naturally, this influenced how I taught. Fortunately, that scared five-year-old and that terrifying kindergarten teacher was not the only influence I'd had, obviously. There were a myriad of influences. I had a fantastic teacher in my ninth grade. In my days, we started chemistry only in grade eight. And when I came to grade nine, I had a different chemistry teacher. And her impact on me was such that after her very first class, she taught us, she walked out of the room at the end of 40 minutes. And I turned to my friend and I said, do you know what I'm going to do in college? I'm going to do chemistry. That was the impact she had on me. And I loved her classes and I waited for chemistry and I could eat chemistry, I could drink chemistry. She made me love it so much. So I carried her too with me wherever I taught. And the rule bound nuns of my, the convent school that I went to, they were always part of my past, part of my psyche and so on. I'm sure you as teachers will have many things which you are carrying as part of your past. You cannot put it down, it is there. A teacher brings his or her life story into the class every day. Where does this life story lie? In the chatter of the mind. In the images that the mind throws up during tired phases or even not so tired phases. In the fears that the mind conjures up. Sometimes we are aware of the fears, sometimes we are not even aware. The aspirations that the heart yearns for. The regrets and disappointments that sometimes pull us back. And in the way that all these impact our behavior. So my colleagues and I, we have always believed in the power of stories. So what did we do? We wrote a set of stories because we know that no teacher needs convincing that stories are powerful. Which teacher does not use storytelling, especially in a land of storytellers like ours? So we sat and compiled 10 stories about teaching and learning in the Indian school scenario. We said, this may help teachers to reflect. And these stories are basically fictionalized fact. What does that mean? My colleagues and I, we are three of us who wrote the book. We are all senior citizens, so we, and we've all been teachers for decades, so we've got lots of stories in our kitty. But what did we do? We took some real stories, we added some fiction to it, and we made a new story. So we call them fictionalized fact, because no story in the book is entirely true, and no story in the book is entirely untrue. It's a mix. And we followed these stories in the second section of the book by discussions of the stories by different stakeholders. We wanted to model the kind of discussion that we would like teachers who read the books to discuss in their schools. It was intended, as I said, to provoke reflection. We find that teachers are reading these stories, quite a few of them. Just before the program started, Praveen told me about some teachers who've read the book and are part of this webinar now. But I wonder how many of you are discussing them? We didn't find too many people discussing them. So what did we do? We devised, we designed a board game. And in that game, we asked the teachers who are participating in the game to read a couple of pages at a time from a story in the book, Teaching Tales, Learning Traits. And we asked them to pick one of three cards. We give them three cards. We do all this online because this happened during the pandemic. And we asked them to reflect on the question contained in each card. Once they reflect, they share their reflection with the others they play it in groups of three, because there are three cards. And all they have to invest by way of time is 20 minutes a day, twice a week. So that's one, one method we used. We said, let teachers read. And once they read, let them reflect. So this connects to another research paper. What I'm going to say next, which is to bring home the importance of writing. And this is a research paper which I stumbled upon when I was working in Azim Flint University. It is by the South African teacher educator called Kathleen Pithouse. And the name of the paper is The Future of Our Young Children Lies in Our Hands. 
re-envisaging teacher authority through narrative self-study. What she did was, in the course that she was conducting, she asked the teachers, there were some seven South African teachers, to write a letter to their most impactful teacher when they were in school. And she did not specify whether that impact had to be a positive one or a negative one. She just said most impactful. To her surprise, every one of those seven teachers wrote a letter to a teacher who had impacted them negatively, humiliated them, made them feel terrified. And once they read the letter, once they wrote the letter, they had to read it out to the other people in the class. When they read, they were in their 30s and 40s when they read out letters to teachers who had taught them when they were five or six or 10. But as they read out these humiliating experiences which they had described in those letters, they sobbed, their whole body language changed. They felt every cell of their body feeling that humiliation and pain all over again. They felt the power of that teacher's impact even in their adult years. And this made them resolve. They said, my God, if this is the impact that teacher who taught me donkeys years ago has, that means we are having this impact on our students. The future of our young children lies in our hands. So they said, we resolve never to have such an impact on our students. So I'd like you to imagine what would have happened if some of your teachers had undergone such a course. So you may wonder, how does it help to tell one's own story? It's something that happened to me. I might read teaching tales, learning trails and stories there and talk about it, but how do I benefit by telling my own story? So again, I go back to that research paper I first referred to, and I quote from there. Teachers bring with them their life stories, stories they have lived, but rarely told in the sense of creating narrative texts that become a way of giving an account of their lives. We teachers rarely tell our stories. We are too busy covering syllabus and correcting papers and attending staff meetings. But telling a story, telling your story is an act of release. Why is it an act of release? It separates the story from the storyteller. Each time I retell the story of that scared five-year-old, I see it happening out there. I recognize its impact on my persona. I can disengage myself from it. And don't we as teachers expect of our students that they should have reading as a habit. They should have the discipline of writing regularly. They must have the habit of focus study. I would like to ask, as teachers, don't we need all these two? Is it right of us to expect this of our students when we don't fulfill even one of these requirements? Why? Why don't we get to do these things? So now I come to, I think the answer to that question many of you would have had in your mind is where do we have the time? So here we go. When can a teacher reflect? You know, teacher's tasks, you know, include all these things. I'm going to reel them deliberately very fast because that's the way a teacher's day is. Tuck, 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 tuck. These are the things a teacher has to do. Here we go, here we go, here we go. Never ending list of tasks. And today in the pandemic, we're adding more to them. So, with all this and straining our eyes, with all the screen time, are you telling me, are you asking me, are you saying reflective practice is an added expectation? Where am I going to find the time with all these things? Very valid question. So I'd like to submit reflection is like the background scale. That's why I have a picture of a Tanpura here. You must have attended classical music concerts at some time or the other, or at least watched them on the television. And when do you notice the Tanpura? You notice it when the vocalist stops singing because the percussionist is adjusting the strings on his uh, rhythm or his tabla. And that's when you hear the drone of the tantra. And you say, aha, that's the scale. That was directing the pitch. Well, there is a drone going on in our minds all the time. And we notice it when our vocalist stops, when our chatter stops. And when do we really reflect? When that drone allows us to ask, hey, how should this be taught? 
and teach this particular topic today, wonder how it should be taught. Why, why should I teach this? Just because it's in the syllabus? Why is it important for a student? How is it going to help the student to learn this quadratic equations formula? X is equal to minus B plus minus blah, blah, blah. What, what, what does it matter? And when is it best for them to learn it? Is it all predetermined by the syllabus or can I think about this a bit? Is this really the right time to teach them this? How did my class go today? Why wasn't I getting the attention of many students in today's class? What went wrong? What did I assume about them? And when do I believe learning happens best? Do I have some belief about that? Am I acting aligned with my belief? Where can I go to develop better communication skills? I don't seem to be communicating well enough. How can I engage with the parents of my students so that they feel trusted? So that we are not India, Pakistan during parent teacher meetings. We are both on the same side of the table. What can we do to enliven staff meetings? Just a few of these questions if we start asking, can you imagine the vibrancy in our schools? Now I come to how can a teacher reflect? There are many, many ways. We are offering one online course as one way. And this is a course called Reflective Writing for Teachers. And it consists of 10 online classes spread over five weeks where teachers read, they discuss, they reflect, and they write. They read from readings of writers like John Holt, Parker J. Palmer, Tara Westover. They watch TED Talks, some short clips, sometimes even just read newspaper middles. And we discuss student issues, parental concerns, report writing, what are a teacher's typical dilemmas, and we share different perspectives. And in this online era, we managed to get teachers across the country. So it's very refreshing for a teacher working in, a, say, in Chandigarh to talk to a teacher who's working in Kolkata or in Coimbatore. It makes a big difference. And they listen to each other, read aloud their writings. That is a new experience for them. You can visit this link if you feel like finding out more about it, but I will give you a glimpse of what the course intends. That's our brochure. It intends to nudge teachers to examine some of the influences on their thinking. It enables teachers to engage with teachers across the country for two hours every week for a total of five weeks. They share their thoughts and experiences through their writings. They read what some educators across the world have written. Think about these readings and they write their own takeaway. So it's not just read and stop. You have to pause, read, reflect, and share your reflection. And this has done something to many of them. It sows in them a desire to use writing as a cathartic tool, if not a means of expression, documentation, leading to publication. So I'm going to share with you the teacher's own words, some of them. What this teacher experienced, the teacher who took the course recently, by getting in touch with my thoughts, feelings, and bodily sensations, I can come out of the conditioning, which I may have imbibed from parents, neighbors, or even my own self. Another teacher who took the course a little earlier says, it has helped me put my thoughts in writing, which is otherwise difficult for me. It encouraged me to make observations about my past and present experiences. It helped me become self-critical. I can honestly say that I don't remember when I had written last. I'm basically a science graduate with an honors in chemistry. One thing that reflective writing taught me is to see things from the other's perspective. It forces teachers to think and share, which is what we would want our students to do. And some of the outcomes are, uh, you know, one of the most difficult assignments in this course is when teachers are asked to define what education is. It's very difficult for an educator to define what education is. Everyone can define what education is not, but what it is, they found it very difficult. So here is what one teacher who took the course last year said. Education for me is awareness, being aware about myself, people, and the environment around me. We must create breathing space for every thought or opinion to grow respectfully. Our education 
should create an environment where we can grow and flourish with differences of opinion without hurting each other. Doesn't that sound like a wonderful world? Another teacher gave, said it gave some belief in, in himself. This course has not just made me write a lot, but has also made me believe that I could write. I don't know the meaning of Akka. This is a teacher from Sikkim. But thank you, Akka, for making me believe that I can write. Another teacher, also a male, he's found it permeating his everyday life even as the course drew to a close. This course has also taught me, he says, to live in the present moment. Reflecting on my past experiences and reliving those moments have helped me to be aware and alert of the present moment. The effect of this course on me has been such that in the midst of daily activities, I find myself pausing for a while and distancing myself from me so as to be aware of my feelings and present experience. I feel that this course has awakened all my senses. I feel fully alive now. I am no more floating on the sea. I don't know if I've taken more than my 20, 25 minutes, but that's what I wanted to share with you. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, you were right on the dot. Thank you. Uh, a couple of uh, quick questions uh, yeah. uh, before we uh, start off with the questions from the audience. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, when we talk about uh, reflective teaching, it yeah. also, uh, in several books that I have uh, come across, Reflective practices also go sort of go hand in hand with mindfulness. Yes, yes. Can you can you elaborate a bit on that? Yeah. So, what is mindfulness? It's basically being in touch with the now. That's the simplest way I can define mindfulness. Yeah, and being in touch with the now means not only being in touch with what is happening outside me, it's also being in touch with what is happening inside me. You know, like um. I still remember in my early days when I was being asked a question by a student, I would freeze because I'd be so scared if I don't know the answer, what am I going to do? And I recently dug up a diary of my early days of teaching. And I found I've very honestly written there that even the questions I know the answers to because I get numb, I'm not able to answer. And then later I remember, I know the answer. So I think even that awareness is helpful. You know, if even one knows that I don't have to uh, whip myself for not knowing the answer, it's this fear which is gripping me in the now, which is making me forget the answer. If I'm even aware of that, I'll be able to pull myself back and say, just give me a minute and maybe I'll get the answer. Or maybe I'll even tell you tomorrow. You know? that, that, that's, I think, mindfulness. An example. The, the second question which I wanted to ask was, uh, you know, the NCFTE, uh, when it came out, it, it uh, announced the goal of creating human and reflective teachers. That was the intent of the National Curriculum Framework. Now, are we losing, are we uh, sort of using the word reflective teachers loosely? Or uh, have we sort of put it in the right uh, context uh, and how do we, as trained teachers, uh, someone who is already working, how do we create spaces for this reflection in a functional uh, school setup? So the first part of your question, I cannot answer how whether they use how they use the word. I can tell you how I use the word. Yeah, okay. and I would say that my answer to that is going to be connected to the second part of your question, which is how in a school can you create the space for this? So I think most of us as teachers, we are implementers. We are given a textbook. We are given a syllabus. We are told what to teach. We are even in some schools told how much to accommodate in each period because there are five sections and all sections should be on par. So if you are teaching sections A, B, and C, the other teacher is teaching D, E, and F. So all of you have to be on par. So you're programmed. You can't even question what is being taught. You can't question whether this is the right textbook. You can't question the sequence of topics, but you're expected to be a reflective teacher. I think this is just, it's just, you know, lip service. If you want a teacher to nurture critical thinking, reflective thinking in students, please give that room for the teacher first. 
allow the teacher to question why are we having a staff meeting today or what may i suggest some uh, items for the agenda of today's staff meeting why are we teaching this particular topic at this level can we switch it to another level give teachers a voice when you don't do that you make teachers very obedient implementers you can be sure they will do the same with their students you will get obedient implementers um i just have a two, two part question uh, uh, reflection happens actually when when you can have a conversation with yourself yes I mean, there, is, there, there is the two of you when when the when the when the whole uh, process of reflection happens you you, uh, you touched upon that a bit yes uh, but but my uh, question is that you know uh, uh, th there are some to whom reflection comes naturally yes because it's 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 uh, quite inborn and they they're able to uh, get into that uh, reflective uh, space yes. in one sense but in your experience do you think the art of reflection or ra rather the, the the ability to reflect upon oneself is yes. something that can be taught and uh, that people can work on to build uh, their yeah thank you ability. that's a very nice question see i i believe that every human being reflects at some time or the other about something or the other so while i agree with you that for some people it is more natural and they do it more deeply and more frequently i do believe that everyone does it at some time or the other for instance i'll give you a simple example uh, my child has a board exam today and the school bus has not come because there's a band suddenly a band has been announced and my child has to reach for the board exam i'm going to immediately think on my feet and i'm going to see what i can do is there a taxi service running if i don't have a um, you know vehicle to take my child myself is there a taxi service running what are the neighbors doing well, i'm going to look for a, a plan of action and then when i think back on it i'm going to ask what about what am i going to do to prevent such a thing happening for the next board exam any parent would do this right now here is something where a crisis is forcing me to think and reflect and act and keep a plan of action ready for future crises it is very rare for a person to automatically reflect like this in the workspace particularly as i said when the nature of the job is such that it is repetitive a repetitive job gives one the illusory sense of being very efficient i've got it i knew my chemistry i didn't have to prepare you wake me up in middle of the night i'll tell you what is an element or compound in a mixture what do i have to prepare so i bored the hell out of my students so i had stopped reflecting about chemistry so it's a danger anyone can fall into but reflection is also something anyone can do yes it can be nurtured how can it be nurtured this course is just one way there are many ways in which it can be nurtured reading and discussing a story that's another there are so many ways I think uh, I think you answered the second part of it because my next question was to was about uh, why should the people only uh, reflect while writing? I mean, yeah, is, 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 it doesn't have to be part, only while writing. Yeah, uh, just have a follow up. Has that got to do with the fact that when you actually put uh, words to paper, pen to paper, yes, yes. that there is there is a, a process of slowing down. Yes, which is essential to the uh, the act of reflection itself. Yes. Yes. is that the reason why you uh, it is it is definitely a big part of it it's mm -hmm. also another part of writing is that you know once once you've written something you've got it as something separate from you for you to look at over and over again you, the same thing happens with an audio recording people who are too busy to write or don't like writing i tell them in the course you can even audio record and send your assignment it's like every time i tell that story of that scared 5 year old neeraja it is not me it is some little child somewhere who was scared you know it's 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 something it's i can distance myself from it and i can look at it so when you talk of writing there's another very strange thing i've noticed which is that when i sit down to write in the old fashioned way with a pen and a paper and a fountain pen no? i love fountain yeah. pens not a, a usual this gel pens my thoughts process slows down very different from when i sit at the computer and start typing It's not that I'm a very free, you know fast typist. I'm not. I haven't learned typing, but there's something about a machine, and there's something about the old-fashioned pen and paper, which changes the pace at which I think.
another question from the chat box, uh, ma'am. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Is uh, it says uh, uh, we we do reflect? Uh, I think it's a teacher uh, writing down. Yes, we do reflect continuously. Yeah. But uh, do we reflect on what is close to our heart? Is it always sort of restricted to that? See, I think naturally we do reflect on what is close to our heart. But sadly, teaching is not close to every teacher's heart. <laughs> Many of us have gone into the teaching profession, not because we wanted to. It was a you know, last resort or it was convenient or whatever. But while I'm not judging people who do that, by reflecting on their teaching, what has been something that they've taken up just, you know, naam ke vaste, can become something they like. I've seen that happen with many teachers. Yeah. Uh, uh, Neeraja, this is Ram yeah. Kumar. Hi. Uh, yeah, hi. And uh, I mean, your uh, uh, talk is very interesting. I've been, uh, I've been thinking. You. Uh, but one question I have is because we we actually work at Agastya International Foundation and we are also working on uh, on, on reflective practice uh, with our instructors. Uh, one interesting uh, uh, thing for me, which keeps worrying, is that teachers keep on uh, worrying about their past events and uh, and also worry about their uh, fear about their you know, future things. This uh, past and future keeps on oscillating, whether it's yeah. human beings, uh, I mean, yeah. or the teachers or any professional yeah. for that matter. It's a nat That's nature the mind. of That's human, the human mind. Itself. Yes. Yes. Uh, so what's your question? So how do we, how do we really, uh, uh, you know, no, no, my question is, how do we really um, uh, use only the writing or is there any other ways of uh, exploring? Well, there are plenty practice? of ways. There are plenty of ways. Uh, writing is what I'm talking about today, but there are plenty of ways. I mean, uh, I remember uh, in the Krishnamurti Foundation School, we used to have staff meetings where we didn't just discuss functional things. You know, when is annual day and who is to be promoted and when who is going on holiday, who is substitution. We, we kept those things for functional meetings. Our staff meetings were reflective discussions. But for that, one has to create a, a non-judgmental space where even the quietest person will feel free to speak. And one can raise such questions like, what is bothering you? What are you scared of? What are you scared of in the future? What are you sad about from the past? The one can play games. We used to play games in the Krishnamurti Foundation School Rajkhat. Every Thursday we used to meet and we used to call it playful awareness and reflection. And these, these are different ways. I mean, you can, you can do all kinds of things. You can just get them to read an interesting piece, a poem. And then reflect. You don't, you don't have to be literary to reflect on a poem. You can just say where it connects to you. There are plenty of ways. Interesting. Interesting. Thank you. Uh, I just had one, uh, just one thought and then, you know, uh, just uh, if you could take it from there. Uh, the, the way I see it, because uh, I, I do a, a fair amount of reflection myself, is that the, the, past, the past is, a, you, you know, the past is a wound that 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 is still that is still in the present in one sense yeah uh, you, you spoke about how the you know the, the five year old girl still lives in you yeah you know so so many uh, years later uh, but don't you think that uh, that that wound that comes from the past and is uh, is fresh in the present yeah. needs a little bit of healing even if it leaves behind only yes. a scar tissue for yes. you to be able to even to be to reflect and move to the stage of awareness i just wanted to absolutely so how does one do that healing? The, the example I gave you of the South African teachers, by writing a letter to the teacher who humiliated them the most, they had some amount of healing. They never sent that letter to the teacher. But just by doing that, it was cathartic. They had put it out, you know. So that gave them some release. And now they were able to view it as whenever I remember that scared five-year-old Neeraja, I tell myself, that's just a thought. It's not the reality now. It's a thought. And what can I get from that thought? I should not terrify my student the way that teacher terrified me. I should not assume my student understands English and Hindi. And I should be humble enough to see what is the language my student understands and speak that language. 
uh, ma'am one question uh, which is not from the chat box uh, yeah. uh, it, it's actually a question on your uh, on your book uh, yeah. which i found very intriguing and the, that was the reason i picked it up yeah uh, the question goes like this is there a way of exploring the work of students beyond just right and wrong yeah uh so th- th- this is uh, from your book on the the reflective uh, learner where you talk about how mistakes need to be understood just beyond uh, yeah. being uh, marked right or wrong could yeah. you elaborate on that a bit yeah so this was a uh, if i if i just give you a little background to that book the idea for that book came from uh, my co-author of teaching tales learning traits kamla who taught for decades in the krishnamurti foundation school chennai and uh, when i was preparing some uh, module for a teacher development workshop she shared with me the notes she had made of one of their staff meetings and they used to have theme based staff meetings so this also answers ramesh's question about how can one you know reflect they would have a theme based uh, uh, staff meeting and one of the themes was mistakes and so she shared with me the notes which was like why do children make the same mistake over and over again why do children make fewer mistakes in the games field than in the classroom and why do adults find it tough to acknowledge mistakes but children acknowledge it easily it had beautiful questions i no sooner did i read those questions and i got very excited i phoned her i said kamla we have to do something with this so we started developing a workshop and then we said we can develop a whole course and that was what gave rise to the idea of missed take it's not a mistake it's there's something we have missed as a take away from that because by definition nobody makes a mistake knowing it is wrong i think it's right that's why i mean i thought it was right to put the number in the first square i didn't know it was a mistake to leave the first square out when i was 5 years old so if we can get into the logic of the child the student and say what made you write that you know in a very non judgmental way not why we written this now why didn't i teach you what's wrong not that but what what was your thinking let me understand so when we try to understand the thinking of that that went behind a student's mind in a in a student's mind when they wrote that mistake there is a lot of learning which can happen and then we do go beyond right and wrong one of the examples in that book is of an english teacher who found that his students were not writing well enough so he started giving them a rubric for them to self assess their own writing and when he found that the rubric they were getting too dependent on it he started making it a little tougher in the margin he would just write sp he would not say which is the spelling was wrong or he would write gr for grammar he would not say where the grammar was wrong so they would have to think where they've gone wrong and they would have to correct it and then he found that those who were not writing so well were now writing much better they were writing more complex sentences but the number of errors was increasing so if you looked only at the number of mistakes they were doing worse than before but he thought deeply and he said when you go from writing simple sentences to complex sentences you're bound to make more mistakes right but the fact that you have got the confidence now to go from writing simple sentences to complex sentences doesn't that show that you're becoming a more confident writer so that chapter is called two wrongs can make a right uh-huh. it's not always true that more mistakes means you're doing worse you're doing better because you're confident enough to try and write complex sentences uh, there there is a comment uh, and a question appended to the comment so uh, yeah. it says that you know uh, reflection need not be only negative stories yes uh, even positive stories could could yes. be a ground for reflection and self improvement yes uh, and your thoughts on that i think that's one of oh, the oh absolutely questions. absolutely reflection need not be only negative it can be positive so uh, every time every time i tell this story to uh, my teachers in my course they get they get charged so if pardon me i'm going to share it with you too it's a positive story okay so to continue the story of my uh, chemistry teacher she impacted me so much in the ninth grade that i wanted to eat chemistry drink chemistry and live chemistry and every evening when i would pack my bag according to the next day's time table if there was a double period of chemistry the double period would shine like it had a luster of its own and i would wish all the h periods had chemistry and anyway so that's how it went and then in my days we had uh, only up to 12th grade only up to 11th grade we didn't have 12th and in my days we had doordarshan on tv and doordarshan and doordarshan we didn't have all this what you have now cable so we watched a program on doordarshan when i was in the 11th grade 
by which time all my classmates knew that i was burning with this zeal for chemistry i had dreamed of becoming a famous chemist one day and discovering an element called neerajanium i had decided everything so there we went we i saw this program on doordarshan where the phd chemistry scholars of delhi university were being interviewed and whether you understand hindi or not you will understand exactly what they were saying from my body language they were being questioned about their choice of career and they said hum to humko kuch nahi milega naukri nahi milegi pata nahi humne kyun phd liya hai chemistry pata nahi kyun kar rahe hain they were like they could have just dropped dead they were wilting so having watched that program i went next day to school and my friends surrounded me they said did you watch the program yesterday i said yes i did they said so what are you going to do in college i said chemistry they said are you nuts didn't you see that program you're not going to get any job and i will never forget what i answered i said you don't understand i'm not doing chemistry to get a job i'm doing chemistry because i love chemistry every time i tell the story i get goosebumps that's the impact my teacher had on me that's the impact of reflecting that is why i get charged every time i teach chemistry so it is not only negative experiences which help you to reflect positive experiences i mean she she gave me my chemistry teacher gave me the urge to study chemistry and when i finished my msc she gave me the urge to become a teacher i thought if my teacher could impact me like this wouldn't it be wonderful if i could impact people like this and that's why i chose to be a teacher uh there is there is this uh, uh you know a, a child is uh, it's, it's not just the teacher who influences the child so there is the parent uh, in, in parental influence as well yes there is, there is the influence of the the ecosystem the environment in which they come Absolutely. up and all yes. of that so uh so do you also engage with parents in terms of for them to for them to be able to reflect on what their children are doing and so how their as, children are responding to uh, i have as as a teacher i have always tried my best to engage with parents in as friendly a way as possible but as a teacher it is not always in the teacher's hands it depends a lot on the management it depends a lot on the school's policy how they deal with parents so there are schools and there are schools you know there are schools where the parents just stand at attention in front of the principal and the teacher they can't open their mouths there are schools where the parents come and fight with the teacher there are schools where the parents and the teachers they really have a dialogue so it's not enough if the teacher wishes to have a friendly relationship with parents it's not all in the teacher's hands there's a nice comment in the chat box uh, thanking you for uh, feeding everyone with neerajanium <laughs> my pleasure my pleasure yeah, there's a question about is is introspection and self reflection are they the same i think they're pretty close yeah i would introspect i you i would use the word introspect when for instance you know at the end of every run of my course i ask my teachers to give me a feedback form i give them a google form and they write their feedback so uh, when people write very positive feedback of course it's very good for my ego i feel very happy but when they write negative feedback i introspect so that's when i use the word i said now what did i do wrong what could i have done better what could i what did i do wrong what could i have done better can also be called reflection but in an introspection is usually triggered by something which makes you ask such questions like what was my role in this you know how can i take care of my role in this? like when you were saying when ramesh was saying that a child has so many influences it's not just the teacher it's the parent it's society it's television these days it's internet it's so many things i can only take care of my zone i'm not god yeah but let me take care of my zone to the best of my ability that's that's the best we can do ma'am uh, another area of work uh, uh, has been action research yes and uh, i i think uh, reflection and action research are very yes. closely yes. connected yes but off late action research seems to be restricted to only teacher education programs and nothing much is actually happening in uh, schools uh, while i shouldn't generalize but it's a harsh uh, reality that most schools don't have it as a part of uh, what they intend to uh, do so uh, do you have uh, have you come across any schools uh, yes. or any teachers who have actually made yes. it a part of their careers oh yes uh, in fact that is one of the programs uh, we offer from thinking teacher 
I have engaged with at least five schools and at least 20, 25 teachers who have conducted action research with my facilitation. And some have even presented them as papers in conferences. But all this requires a head of the school, a principal, who wants this kind of development for the teacher and is prepared to not only invest financially, but also to give the teacher time during the day to engage in this. Not say, you find your time for it, then it won't work. Uh, there's another uh, question. You had mentioned that your chemistry teacher was a big influence yeah. uh, on you choosing that subject. The, the question is, what aspect of uh, her teaching made you love that? Uh, yeah, so um, at the risk of sounding immodest, I must say that um, I was... Something has happened. Somebody's sharing their screen. I'm sorry. Yeah. No problem. So at the risk of sounding immodest, I must say that uh, I use many more innovative methods to teach chemistry than my teacher did. Okay. <laughs> but at that time, in that ambience, she shone like a beacon. And why? She was so clear. You know, I had physics teachers who would read from the book. Can you imagine teaching physics reading from the book? And they would, you know, make us mug up definitions and come to class and say, dictating notes, dictating notes in physics. Consider a candle. I remember thinking, I don't want to consider a candle. Why should I consider a damn candle? It makes no difference to my life. But we had a chemistry teacher who would so clearly explain without even looking at the book. In fact, she had an eccentricity. She would look up at the ceiling. She wouldn't even look at you. So she'd look up at the ceiling and she'd be teaching, but she was so clear that when I went home, I didn't even have to look at the book. I knew it. It was so clear. So she made the subject so easy. Um, you know, the chat, you know, the chat box is you know, getting burned up with all the yeah. with, with <laughs> people saying, you know, it's, 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 they're, they're already reflecting in one sense. I mean, good, good. Uh, that's coming through but i also want to bring this uh, you know uh, also bring about uh, bring it to some sort of some kind of a, a, a real life kind of a, a, yeah. a, where uh, you know in, in one sense you know the, the, there is also this thought that reflection and slowing down which yes. is go hand in hand yes is, is is kind of counterintuitive in in one sense you know in in, in the present uh, generation of thinking mm -hmm. both of these things so have you fa have you faced pushback let's say from teachers institutions parents are not saying that you why know, do you say it's counterintuitive can you just explain yeah because i say today every, everything is about doing things in a hurry getting things done quickly or you know uh, pushing the envelope in terms of doing more things yeah but my my understanding of reflection is that that it, it necessarily requires us to actually slow down yes it does and 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 therefore in that sense i said you know it, it, it's, it's counterintuitive versus the the standard narrative of doing it's things. contrary to the standard narrative uh, yeah, yeah. It's contrary to the standard narrative. And I have had this uh, discussion with heads of mainstream schools, alternative schools. And I have, in fact, found it's very ironical. In mainstream schools, teachers are running, 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 running because their school has to get the uh, in inter competition, inter school competition prize, this trophy. They have to get all the first rankers, their board exam results have to be the best, blah, 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 blah. In alternate schools, they're running because they have to have maximum innovation. They've got to have so much creativity. They've got to have lots of free expression by their children. Run, 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 run. So everybody's running, but for different things. So I have raised this question to many heads of schools, even alternative schools, saying, where can you get your teachers to reflect if they're going to be running all the time? And many of them have acknowledged that, yes, that is a problem. And it's, it's, I, I must honestly confess that when I taught in a Krishnamurti Foundation school in Chennai, I was given class six uh, science, class eight chemistry and class 11 chemistry. I managed for class six to be very innovative because there was no pressure. They didn't have exams in that school. They didn't have exams till eighth grade. So I didn't have somebody sitting on my head saying, you have to finish this. You have to, you know, examination pattern, questions and all that nonsense. So I had a whale of a time. Eighth standard, already I felt the pressure because that was the first year of exams. The students were also getting tenser and I also had something which was, you know, limiting me. By the time it came to 11th, I did nothing. I used to come home and ask myself, what am I doing differently teaching in a Krishnamurti school as opposed to a mainstream school? Nothing. Because the ISC was my three-year BSc compressed into one year. That much syllabus. I had to teach it. The students had to pass the exam. 
so when it comes to heavy syllabus our hands are tied but at least in the lower classes where there isn't a board exam hanging like a damocles sword i think heads of schools can come up with ways of lowering the burden on teachers making them less loaded less exhausted and giving these free spaces for discussion and reflection it is possible i have done it as a head of a school i think one of the uh, questions that is that you know uh, fear and competition the comments that has come up is uh, tends to kill the creativity that is that is essential to teaching as well as learning i'm sorry fear your voice is breaking can you tell me again i'm not able to yeah, hear you uh, well, what is the the question that's come up in the chat can yeah. you learn better now yeah there is uh, the fear, fear and competition it says uh, can uh, can kill up the kill, kill the creativity that is essential to teaching as well as learning yes and, and therefore do you have any thoughts on that because yeah absolutely i agree both fear and competition can just kill it and um, i can only talk about fear which is my my experience is that teachers also feel a lot of fear and if there is room for a teacher to own up to feeling afraid the teacher will give students the space to own up to being afraid without that a teacher will keep suppressing his or her fear and that will come out as aggression and that will trigger fear in the children we can't say don't feel fear we are human beings of course we'll feel afraid something or the other we'll feel afraid maybe my principal is terrifying maybe the correspondent is terrifying maybe the fact that i may lose my job is terrifying there so many things i can be scared of but if i can at least acknowledge my fears that's a beginning and if i can be not judged for it that you're a teacher how dare you feel scared are i am a teacher every time i face an audience i feel scared today until i started the talk i was nervous i said i'm going to face i don't know how many people so no matter how old you grow you will feel scared acknowledge it that's the humanness thank you uh, thank you i think this is uh, we had uh, an extensive discussion uh, your final uh, closing remarks uh, on today's the closing uh, remarks are you know i'm in the twilight of my life and uh, my passion is i would like before i leave this planet to see as many teachers as possible in our country write about their teaching experiences we have hardly any documentation almost zero by teachers in our country and when i conducted teacher training workshops from azim prem university i was handicapped when i looked for literature because it was all from the west when i would cite those western examples i could see the doors of my indian teachers minds closing and i don't blame them they would say ha waha to ye sab ho sakta hai ye to hamare desh hai hamare hum nahi kar sakte ye ye saap nahi kar sakte so jo aap kar sakte ho what that which you can do please write about it let other teachers hear about it share your experiences share your dilemmas start discussion forums this is my earnest request to the teachers who are there in the audience that's what i'd like to close with. thank you uh, thank you uh, ma'am i think this was uh, this was a fabulous uh, discussion incidentally you. Uh, you know i was uh, i was actually doing a right uh, making a short write up on reflection uh, this afternoon i mean it, it had nothing to do with the, this uh, this one but it had to do with the, uh, some of the so it's it's it's, it's added to that uh, uh, so and, and and i suppose i think i speak for everybody everyone else in this everybody in the audience but i say i think this we've had so much food for thought that is going to take a long time for us to be able to digest it and then assimilate it and then thank you practice it's it's been an absolute pleasure and privilege to thank you had you on this platform thank you um, thank you so much my pleasure and uh, thank you all the, the everyone who's been here i think we've had uh, another 250 people who have joined us and therefore it's, it's we've enjoyed bringing it, bringing this to you i'm sure you have enjoyed, enjoyed it too thank you Have a good evening. Thank you ma'am.